We know that there are four fundamental forces of nature in physics. Um, gravitational, weak nuclear, electromagnetic, and strong nuclear. Now, that's an increasing order of strength. So the stronger ones are at the bottom, the strong nuclear force is the strongest force, and gravitational is the weakest. But let's take electromagnetic as an example. How does a proton know when there's an electron nearby, and how is the message transferred that it needs to be attracted? Well, a theory says that uh, there is an undetectable exchange particle, a particle that goes from the proton to the electron or vice versa, and sends that information saying you should be attracting. So uh, each one of these forces has its own exchange particle, the particle that is responsible for conveying those messages. Um, and those exchange particles are gravitational uh, force has what we might call a graviton. Now, a graviton has not been discovered yet. And they're, they're so undetectable that we can't even prove that they exist. But um, the, the, the idea still stands that there should be a gravitational exchange particle. Uh, the weak nuclear force is mediated by three different types of bosons, either a positive W boson a negative W boson, or a neutral Z boson. Um, the electromagnetic force is mediated by photons, and the strong nuclear force is mediated by gluons, um, and sometimes mesons. Uh, so we now have exchange particles for each one of these forces. Now, so far, you might have uh, represented particle interactions in terms of an equation, like a bit like a chemical equation. But that doesn't take into account these, these exchange particles. Um, and it's really helpful to be able to represent this so we can figure out if these exchanges are viable or not, if they could actually occur in nature. So... What we can do is, instead of just drawing an equation, we can draw a diagram. Now, these things are called Feynman diagrams after the, uh, after the physicist Richard Feynman, uh, who invented them. And they have two axes, one of which is time, which is usually on the vertical axis, and one of which is space, which is usually on the horizontal axis. Now, with, within these graphs, we can represent these particle interactions. Um, but rule one, I'm going to take you through four different rules. Rule one is the axes. Rule two is if you have those axes, time and space. Then rule two is how we represent our exchange particles. Let's say, for example, we have two electrons that are going to interact. Well. We draw uh, fermions or regular particles, observable particles, as arrows like that. So we could call that one an electron. Uh, and then another electron is coming in here. So they're both moving through time. They're both moving forwards through time. Uh, and they're moving towards each other. So they're moving closer through space. So we've got our two electrons. Now we know that they're going to repel each other. And we know from our... Um, from our exchange particles up here that the electromagnetic force is mediated by photons. So a photon can travel from one of the electrons to the other and then they know to repel each other so they bounce off. Uh, and that would be our uh, that would be our diagram for that would be our Feynman diagram for two electrons interacting with each other. So we've got our initial particles. If we run through it in terms of time, we start down here at the bottom and we're going that way. And so we have two electrons to start off with. They interact with each other by means of a photon, which is the squiggly line. The squiggly line is the exchange particle. So that's exchanging the electromagnetic force, which is causing the two electrons to repel. So they go off again and get further apart in space. Now, this space, it's just important to mention that this space here at the moment, we're trying to represent three dimensions on just one axis. So even if this was an attractive force, even if this was an electron and a proton interacting, you'd probably still see them on the Feynman diagram moving apart afterwards, even though it's an attractive force. It's just a, it's just a spatial acknowledgement that they're interacting. They don't have to be moving in exactly the right direction through space 
um, but it just shows that they're interacting with each other and what the, what the products are. So that's an example of, um, of how we would represent our uh, two electrons interacting. Now, there are different types of exchange particles, as we've seen, and our rule two is what those uh, exchange particles look like on a Feynman diagram. So uh, first of all, our straight lines like that are our fermions, our regular observable particles. Um, such as electrons, protons, neutrons, quarks, anything like that. Um, our uh, photons, as we've already seen, are a squiggly line. Um, our bosons, our W minus, W plus, or Z bosons, are usually a dotted line. Um, and finally, our gluons, which are responsible for the strong nuclear force, are like a kind of weird twisty spring like that. Okay, so that's rule two, is what type of line do you draw? Um, or, when you're reading a diagram, what does the type of line mean? Okay, so rule three is about antiparticles. So let's say, for example, you had... Um, a uh, an electron and a positron interacting. Now, an electron is the antiparticle of, an, of a positron and vice versa. So if they do interact, they are going to annihilate. So here we have our electron coming forward in space like we did last time. But this time we've got our positron coming down to meet it here. Now notice that the positron is traveling backwards in time. So there's a lot more layers of depth that you can go into the physics, which you don't need to understand in thorough detail for IB, but just know that antiparticles travel backwards in time. Antiparticles, the arrow, is downwards. So when an electron and a, and a positron interact, they annihilate with each other, which produces energy in the form of a photon. So there's a photon of energy. And so that is our particle interaction diagram, our Feynman diagram for an electron and a positron interacting. So rule three is antiparticles go backwards in time. Okay, finally, the fourth rule is about the junctions. Okay, now I'm gonna, we're gonna uh, go back here and we're going to look at the two diagrams that we've drawn so far and I'm going to highlight in a particularly jazzy pink the different junctions in each of the diagrams. So here's a junction, here's a, a, an interaction, a place where the lines meet and what we need to make sure is that at every one of these junctions we're conserving the things that we normally conserve when we're talking about the whole particle changes. So those things are charge, lepton number, baryon number. Okay, so for this one, for example, we've got um, we've got a conserved charge. We've got a conserved lepton number, and we've got a conserved baryon number. So the baryon number is the easiest one because it's zero everywhere. So that's definitely conserved. Um, lepton number we have um, a lepton number of an electron has a lepton number of one. So we've got a lepton number of one coming in. We've also got a lepton number of minus one coming in. So both of those are coming into this junction. So we've got a plus one and a minus one coming in. So we've got no lepton, a zero lepton number coming in. And the photon has no lepton number. So we've got a zero lepton number coming out. So that's right. That's balanced. Charge, we've got the same kind of thing. Uh, charge, we've got uh, the... Electron, so we've got, let me do charge in a different colour. So we've got minus one charge here. We've got plus one charge here. They're both coming in, so we've got a minus one and a plus one charge coming in. So we've got a neutral charge overall. Minus one plus one is zero. And the photon has zero charge as well. So charge is also balanced. So an electron and a positron can annihilate in this way. This is a viable interaction. Okay, let's go back up to our previous diagram. Here we've got two junctions 
And at this left one here, we've got a lepton number of one coming in, a lepton number of one coming out, and the photon has no lepton number. So that's fine. Uh, we've got one coming in, one coming out, so that's balanced. And in terms of charge, minus one coming in, minus one going out as well. So that's balanced. Uh, baron number zero everywhere. Same on the right side, lepton number, charge, and baron number all balanced. So not only are you looking to balance the lepton number, the charge, and the baron number in the whole interaction, but it also must balance at every one of these junctions as well. Okay, and these are not the most complicated diagrams you'll get, and you just need to be aware, be, be aware that all of those things need to balance at each one of the junctions. So our final rule, rule four, is at each junction, balance, charge, lepton number, and baryon number. Those are your four rules for drawing Feynman diagrams. One final thing to consider is whether or not these particles, these exchange particles, well, actually, these exchange particles travel through time or not. So, so far, we've only seen photons in these interactions, and you'll have noticed that I've drawn the photon going horizontally. Um, now, that's linked to the fact that photons travel at the speed of light. We don't need to go into that in detail at the moment, but the other... The other uh, exchange particles do not. A graviton, we think, does travel at the speed of light, but the other exchange particles don't, and so they should move through time as well. So if you were going to draw, if you were going to draw an, a Feynman diagram with a photon, you would draw the photon going horizontally. But if you're going to draw it with a boson, you would want the boson to go up at an angle slightly because it's going through time, it's traveling through time, and so it's um, it's. You know, this is the time axis, and this is the space axis. So a boson, for example, would travel through time. A gluon would travel through time. So those two are going to always angle up slightly when you're looking at the time axis because they travel through time. Do, they do not travel at the speed of light. They travel through time, so they're angled up slightly. So that's an unofficial rule five.